Welcome to the Sonata Series. I'm Mina Choi, and I'm delighted to introduce this evening's event. The Sonata Series has been an ongoing part of our season at CMW, and though we have reimagined it for this format, it continues to uniquely spotlight individual musicians. What you are about to see and hear tonight are not only performances by the musicians, but in addition, conversations that may provide insight into their individual creative processes. Tonight's program features resident musicians Jesse Holstein and Lisa Saylor, joined by guest pianist Ivan Tan. Ivan is on faculty at Brown University, where he teaches music theory, and is also a PhD candidate in music theory at the Eastman School of Music, where he is completing a dissertation on keyboard performance in 1970s progressive rock. Ivan is equally at home playing classical piano or rocking out on a guitar, and he has performed in venues ranging from the Apple Hill Ch Center for Chamber Music to the Rochester Fringe Festival. We are delighted to have Ivan joining us this evening. Tonight's program includes a Gamba Sonata by Johann Sebastian Bach and also the works of three living composers, friends of the musicians and of CMW, Anthony Green, Dana Lynn, and Jesse Montgomery. You will also have the opportunity to hear from the composers themselves in conversation with the musicians. I want to take a moment to thank everyone who made this evening's event possible. Our recording engineers, Jim Moses and Rebecca and Gabriel from Atomic Clock, Bell Street Chapel for use of their space, Kelly Reed, Liz Cox, and of course the musicians. And now we turn to our program. Hope you enjoy. Oh wow, he's here! Johann Sebastian Bach, it's so nice to finally get to meet you. I'm a big fan. What should I call you? Is Johann okay? Oh, I know, maybe Johnny. Oh, oh, please, please. Herr Bach is fine. Oh, I just thought that maybe since we're having this chat, we could consider ourselves on a first name basis. No, 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 please, please. Herr Bach. Oh, okay. Well, you can still just call me Lisa, that's fine. Uh, whatever. Well, I've got to say, it's kind of amazing that we get to have this conversation on Zoom. It's so nice mm -hmm. of you to figure out the technology and everything for this interview. Well, yes, yes. The Zoom thing is, is interesting. I was just Zooming with someone from around your time period the other day. He said he was from the year 2021. Really? What did he say? I have a lot of questions about 2021. Uh, not really sure. We mostly talked about me. I wasn't paying much attention to him. Okay. Wow. Well, at least now I know there's still human life on Earth in the year 2021. Well, um, I don't know about human life. This guy had green scales and horns on his head. But there does seem to be some form of life, at least. Huh. And you two really talked mostly about you. Well, um, I'm an interesting guy. Sure. Anyway, so I'm playing your G major viola da gamba sonata on this concert, and it's just so gorgeous. Ah, so the viola da gamba has survived into the 21st century. It is falling a bit out of fashion at the moment where I am. And I'll admit, I was worried that the people of the future would forget all about it. Uh, well, I hate to break it to you, but actually people don't really play the viola da gamba so much anymore. But I'm playing this piece on the viola, which mm -hmm. I think is pretty awesome. Oh, so you're playing my music on an instrument I didn't write it for? Well, yeah, technically, but a lot of people do that with your music. Have you ever heard of Wendy Carlos? Nine, nine, and I don't want to. Fine. Well, viola da gamba, or just plain old viola, I think your writing is 
so gorgeous and organic. The viola, and I'm sure in your time, the viola da gamba, it's just such an underappreciated instrument. We don't have as much music written for us as, say, violinists and cellists do, so it's so great that you appreciate us re middle register instruments and write so soloistically for us. What do you love about the viola? Uh, about that, uh, I originally didn't actually write this for the viola or the viola da gamba. What? Yes, yes, this, this work was recycled. Sometimes I just feel a bit lazy, you know. Look, I have like a million children. I'm going to be a grandma. I direct the Collegium Musica. Ever heard of that? And I literally build pipe organs. I'm a busy guy. What do you want me to do? Come up with a completely original material all the time? Well, a lot of us are busy people, Johan. Yo, please, please, it's Helba. What do you do that makes you so busy? Sit around in your house all day? Uh, no. Please, I talked to that guy from 2021. I know you are just sitting around in your house. Okay, okay, that's fair. So, what instrument was this sonata originally written for? Uh, 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 the question is really what instruments? This was originally a trio sonata for two flutes and the and the uh, clavier or continuo. When I rearranged it, I put the flute one part in the right hand of the keyboard player and the flute two part in the hands of the violist. Wait, so... I'm actually just playing a flute two part. That's a little insulting, don't you think? Oh, I thought you said my viola writing was soloistic and gorgeous and organic. Yeah, I, I guess I just can't believe you gave me a hard time for playing this piece on the viola instead of the viola da gamba when you yourself recycled this part from a second flute. But... Honestly, I still love this piece. It's so warm and inviting, and it sits so well on this instrument. You'd never know that this wasn't the original instrumentation. Yeah, yeah, I am that good. Uh, I told you I'm an interesting guy. Okay. Well, I'd just like to let our audience know that if they enjoy this performance, they should also check out Community M Music Works' upcoming Bach Marathon. It's an overnight radio marathon that features performances by musicians all over the world, but especially from right here in Providence, of music by and inspired by Johnny over here. Please, please, Herba. And by the way, what does inspired by me mean anyway? Can people get away with doing anything as long as they say it is inspired by me? I mean, the bar is pretty high since my music is so gorgeous and organic. Ugh, no, of course they can't get away with just anything. Although, I did hear that one year someone saw the violin in half during the Bach Marathon, so... Wow. Well, maybe now I have this Zoom thing figured out. I'll work on learning how to use a radio just so I can tune in. I'd like to hear a violin being sawed in half. Well, old Johnny, old pal, it's been great to chat. I learned a lot. I suppose it's been interesting to chat with you too. And really, uh, good luck in 2021. Wait, wait, what's, what's that supposed to mean? Herr Bach? Herr Bach, what does that mean? What did that guy say? Oh, he's gone. Okay.
So I am here with Anthony Green, who's the composer of On Top of the Frosted Hill, which is one of the pieces we'll be playing uh, in this concert. So um, Anthony, do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself and your compositional background? Definitely. Hello, everybody. My name is Anthony R. Green, and I was born in Virginia and raised in Providence, Rhode Island, so I consider myself a New England boy. And I went to, I did my undergraduate at Boston University and my master's at New England Conservatory. And I did some further studies in Boulder, Colorado, before moving to the Netherlands in 2013. And when I got into music, it was when I was about five years old, playing piano melodies after my kindergarten teacher would play short mel melodies on the piano in the corner of our kindergarten class. So I was always a creative child. And when it came to music, I was constantly making melodies. And that's how I basically got into composing but without being aware of it. So when I started playing piano, I fell in love with Debussy, Chopin, and Bach. And those composers, the music of these composers really influenced my early pieces. And um, later on, I really fell in love with contemporary music and music experimentation and learning about different ways of approaching sound and time and harmony. So that's a little bit of what inspires me today. One thing that really uh, I found really interesting as I've been learning this piece is sort of how you use register and like sort of the different piano sounds that you get um, in different parts of the piece. So how has just your playing your own experience playing the piano influenced how you write music? Well, one thing about playing the piano that's immediately striking is how big the piano is in terms of its range, right? 88 keys, so we have some of the lowest notes that an instrument can make and some of the highest notes that an instrument can make in one instrument. And that is so exciting. And the cool thing about playing the piano is when you play the lowest notes and you play a chromatic scale all the way up to the highest notes, then you also hear different changes in color and resonance. So as a composer, I'm always fascinated by this sonic property. Yeah, and I guess regarding the interpretation of the piece, you write in your program there that the piece is inspired by your experiences living in Boulder and witnessing the environment there and all the mountains and you know the landscape. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Definitely. So I remember within the first month of arriving to Boulder in 2008, I was asked to go on a hike 
And it was one of these wonderful, wonderful experiences. Me and a couple of friends went to this place called the Royal Arch, which is a natural arch formation right uh, in the mountains that are really close to Boulder. And when you're climbing up the path, you can hear animals and hear water and you can hear the wind interacting with the trees and you just smell all sorts of things and feel all sorts of textures. And it's also a little bit scary if it's your first time in Boulder because when you climb up the, the path, if you're not acclimated to the climate and the altitude, then you can also get altitude sickness, <laughs> which also happened to me, unfortunately. But all of these experiences really took me out of my East Coastness and placed me firmly in a new environment that I had to quickly learn how to adjust to. So all of these memories played a really crucial part in composing this piece, both consciously and unconsciously. Memory definitely plays a big role in this piece. So another memory that you write about in the program there is a uh, sort of song that you learned in church as a child that you incorporated the melody of into the piece. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? One of the songs that I remember singing and playing when I was a child is a song called Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, For the Bible Tells Me So. And this is a pretty popular children's religious song in the States. And I think it expands denominations. It is firmly a Christian song, but I don't think it's necessarily a Baptist song. You know, I think many different denominations sing this song in their services. But the melody is really wonderful. And the overall message is one of comfort. Mm -hmm. And so when you zoom out and think about nostalgia also being a form of comfort, sometimes, not necessarily all the time, but most of the time, I, I think nostalgia is a form of comfort. And then you match that with my experience in Boulder, being comforted by the environment of the mountains and the vast spaces, and then match that with just the overall feeling of being comforted by music. I thought the inclusion of this children's song was just another way to add to this meta level of comfort within the piece. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us about uh, the piece. We are very much enjoying working on it and look forward to performing it for you. Thank you so much. I'm really, really honored to have you play this piece and I look forward to the performance.
I'm really excited to talk to uh, my friend for many, many years, uh, Dana Lynn, who wrote one of the pieces that you'll hear at the Sonata Series. And uh, welcome, Dana. It's awesome to see you. Awesome to see you, too. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah. So uh, for those of you who don't know, Dana uh, and I went to Oberlin together. And uh, we also played in the Royal Farfisa Disco Juggernaut, which was the the finest disco orchestra of Lorraine County in that time, in the mid-90s. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, and we actually were housemates um, at Oberlin, and Dana is a Brooklyn-based composer, pianist, violinist, illustrator, animator, and all of the above. So, um, yeah, uh, tell us about like what inspired you to write that piece. Was it a commission, or like what? How did it come about? It was actually a commission by. Uh, the violinist Johnny Gandelsman and he he didn't have a requirement thematically or anything so the piece is actually inspired by plankton you know or this very very tiny creatures but um, they are an essential part of the aquatic ecosystems and their food for like some of the hugest animals in 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 our world, so kind of, I find them quite fascinating. The piece is called "A Current Took Her Away," and so is this sort yeah, the of plankton like, is female. <laughs> yes, yes, and is this sort of like kind of a day in the life of a piece of plank of a of a plankton, like? Yes. Okay. Yeah, on the current, you know stormy current originating from maybe the arctic you know in my migrating as all ocean creatures do yeah i have a zoom interview with the plankton after this um you know it, it's it's interesting uh, when i was first learning it you know um over the summer um you know i saw these metronome markings and like, I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to try to sort of do that. And, you know, because as a pretty much straight up classical player all the time, I'm like, and who does a lot of orchestral playing? I was thinking, yeah. okay, I'd like to make, you know, play it as accurately as I can. And then uh, when I played it for you um, I, uh, a few weeks ago, remember you just saying, oh, this needs to be a lot more improvisatory. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of trying to make it sound. I mean, it's your piece, but I'm trying to make it sound like I'm making it up. Yes, that's a exactly. A little bit more. I, I think a lot about time uh, within the parameters of music. And that means so many different things, and it means different things within genres. But in general, I've been thinking about um, time just maybe because we're in a pandemic and there's very little opportunity to play live with people. When you've heard your pieces being played, uh, say like when Johnny played the premiere or when you've had other pieces being performed um, and maybe something's not how you originally heard it in your ear are you pleasantly surprised sometimes like I'm always actually thrilled whenever anyone plays anything I've written it sounds <laughs> usually to me I guess I think I've, I can only think of one situation in which it didn't sound better than what I thought it was going to sound like. And that was just kind of a situation where I, I, I didn't get to actually properly workshop something and mm -hmm, kind mm -hmm. of thought that didn't go so well. It's really fun for me to hear what other people are doing. I just want to say also, um, you know, it's been really special for me working on this um, for a few different reasons. I mean, we go way back. Um, yeah. when we were teenagers at arriving at Oberlin. And, um, but uh, I just think it's, it's an awesome piece of music. And I, I love that it's a little different every time I play it. 
um, because there is such room for flexibility. And um, it's also been a, it's been a challenge technically yeah. to play. Um, so it's been like, you know, aside from the expressive side of things, it's been like really good for my chops. Yeah. And it's just, it's just awesome to play music by such a good friend. And um, yeah. And I just think it's, it's a really fantastic piece and I'm going to be playing it for the rest of my life.
So I'm super psyched to have talk to Jesse Montgomery for a little bit. Um, as many of you know, Jesse uh, was a resident musician at Community Music Works, and we were in the Providence String Quartet together, and is now uh, just tearing it up as a composer, violinist, <laughs> and uh, yeah. And uh, so I'm psyched to play. Uh, your Rhapsody, number one, and just to get the conversation started, um, yeah, how did, um, I know you, you wanted to make sort of a suite of solo pieces for, for the stringed instrument family, uh, when, yeah, was that, like, was that, it was in 2015? The original idea for this cycle of Rhapsodies was like, was that I would write it for, um, different instruments but as i've gone along in time i've i i'm sticking to writing for violin oh yeah. okay I made a series of six pieces for violin and writing them for mm -hmm. specific players oh so uh, kind of like the Isai and bach cycles exactly yeah yeah uh -huh. yeah and i have actually since written a rhapsody number two yeah, and you know, um, so it was cool that I, I got to play it for you uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And you had mentioned that, um, in retrospect, you had wished you had just written, uh, put in the words, like, improvisatory or something like that. Because I, mm -hmm. I remember, um, you know, I was like, had the metronome out, and I was like, oh, Jesse's going to make sure that this is there. <laughs> and then um, when I played it for you, you were really encouraging me to, like, just open it up. And I remember you said that, oh, I should have just put in an improvisatory style. So has mm -hmm. your relationship with the piece evolved since, um, since you wrote it? Has it gotten more free? Has it um, mm -hmm. been when you first wrote it? Well, I would say that in listening to different people's interpretations of it, I think it's more even probably strengthened that idea that I was sharing with you, which was, you know, that because there, it turns out like, as I've heard different performances, there's so much range of, there's so much like flex, there is a lot of flexibility in the piece, I think inherently. So I think just like reiterating that like there is no one way, you know, I mean, there's a pacing that I, you know, I'm personally more feel better about, you know, um, 
that I think is indicated, it's indicated in the, in the, in the speed of the notes, like as it goes from six tuplets to 30 seconds and to the, you know, um, I think that's indicated, but I think, um, that there's a, yeah, there's a more and more I'm realizing that the flexibility that I'm hoping for is, is really what the piece is about. And I'm like, and in that, yeah, and so it, like, I, I guess it, it has, like, continues to have room to evolve, I guess, in that way. So, yeah, I mean, it's been such a thrill for me to play it. Obviously, we go way back, oh, and so uh, we've played a lot of music together. And, um, you know, I remember uh, when you were at CMW and you were writing some stuff, and then... Um, and then, uh, you know, there was this amazing voice that you had. And um, it's just been so thrilling to see what you've been able to do and um, how far your your reach has been and who you've been able to connect with. It's just, it's really uh, amazing. And uh, it's just also special playing a piece from a really good friend. And uh, yeah, it's, I mean, I think it's an, awesome piece. i love that you're Anyways. playing this piece it makes it's just as special knowing that friends good friends are playing my music it, that's the best that's the reward i mean uh, yeah all ensemble this and ensemble orchestra that i mean yes it's fantastic and amazing and wild and crazy but i love that my friends are playing my music it just means that really i mean that's what music is right it's like that you yeah. feel the most you feel the deepest connection in the in that way and that always feels that way yeah i'm sure lots of people would be yeah. curious to hear what, what you're up to sure thing um so like COVID aside right because everything is up in the air in terms of how performances will happen between now and like next fall but um one of those is the new york philharmonic um, Project 19 initiative where they commissioned 19 uh, women composers. Um, my piece um, just made, just was right on the COVID cut. So it didn't, uh-huh. <laughs> it didn't make the premiere this fall, but it's going to be reprogrammed um, for next season. Um, wow. So that'll be an orchestra piece of some length, of significant length. Um, and um, I have um i'm also going to be working on an opera i'm starting oh. to work on an opera wow it's going to um go into workshop next year um with the met and lincoln center holy cow then met and lincoln center new works program just found out it was just announced let's say about a week ago so it's what? very fresh wow uh, yeah it- do you have like a libretto and everything? Um, I don't have a libretto, but I have a story and a concept, um, which is um, actually really sort of continuing um, the lineage and storytelling um, from my mom's plays, um, and in, uh, specifically related to the story of my great great grandfather, who was a Buffalo soldier. Um, and, uh, not many people know the history of Buffalo soldiers in the United States. And so I felt like it was an, an opportunity to do my own research and my own exploration of that history. Um, and then, and also to shed light on that, um, unique kind of perspective and moment in our history. And you heard it here first, people. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, come here for all your that's right. Monty news. So no, that's that's just amazing. You know, you are family at CMW, and uh, yeah, Always. we love you. And uh, I yeah, love you too. Yeah. So, all right, thanks, Jesse, Jesse. Thanks so much. Yeah. yeah.
Thank you.